welcome to America and the City of God. Uh, this is a new uh, course I will be offering. I hope in the future to be able to build a wide network of different classes that I will teach. And this first one is going to be on political philosophy. If you're if you found this video through YouTube, you can find a link to sign up to the course in the video description. Uh, this course is being offered uh, through Mary Queen of the Home Academy in conjunction with Meaning of Catholic. Um, and for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Gideon Lazar. I did a uh, bachelor's in classics and medieval studies at the Catholic University of America. And I'm currently completing a master's in theology at St. Cyril and Methodius Byzantine Catholic Seminary. All right, so I'm going to pull up the syllabus for the course and just give a brief overview of what is on the syllabus. And after that, I will include in this video as well the first lecture in the course, so that way you can find out a bit about what the class will actually be like when you're taking it. Now, when you finally see the syllabus for the class, it may look slightly different, and it will be modified throughout the semester and throughout the year as uh, the uh, we go through the course as I learn what things work and what things aren't working, uh, what needs to be included, do we need to slow down, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is a brief overview to what will be contained in the course. Uh, so this course will introduce students to the principles of political philosophy. And so we're going to study political philosophy as it develops from the time of Aristotle through the church fathers and the scholastics into the modern period, and then look at the American founding fathers and evaluate the American founding fathers in light of uh, Catholic teaching on politics. And then finally, we'll end the year with a brief overview of Catholic social teaching and the church's current teachings on politics. Um, so this course will consist primarily of primary source materials. Uh, so I'm going to be assigning primary source materials to read each week, and students should read over these materials, taking notes. And um, then I will have a lecture as well that will be sort of one to two hours each week, going through the readings, trying not to give my own opinions on whether it's right or wrong, but just trying to explain and understand what we're reading, because we're reading very difficult materials sometimes, but very important materials. And once you get a hang of what they're actually saying, it's, they're usually not as complicated as they first seem. And then hopefully you can return to the readings after you've gone through them once, seen the lecture, and see if uh, passages that you found difficult the first time are now clarified by the lecture. Um, and if you're taking this, so this course is being offered for both uh, adults to take, just auditing it, or high school students to take for a grade. And so high school students uh, have to do the readings each week and will have to also do the tests and the papers. Uh, adults taking the course are obviously encouraged to do the readings. And I think you'll get a lot more out of the class if you do the readings. But of course, you're welcome to sign up for it and just watch the lectures as well, or only do part of the readings. Um, now, all the readings will be given online. Um, I'll make sure everything that I can get is in the public domain or is uh, small enough that it counts under fair use. Um, but I highly recommend you print it out, put it in a binder so you can mark it up, or you can buy printed editions of the works. Uh, you'll, you should be able to find the same translations we're using, but if you use another translation, that's perfectly fine as well. As I mentioned, you can either take the course auditing it, or if you're a high school student, you can take it for credit. Now, this is a difficult class, so I recommend that you do this um, the, also for high school juniors and seniors, but younger students who are gifted can take it as well. Um, now, I do have to give a disclaimer that uh, Mary, Queen of the Home Academy, is not officially accredited, and so I can't give formal credit, but colleges really don't care about formal credit. I can provide a grade, I can provide proof of the class, and I can also provide contact information. So if colleges have questions about the class, they can contact me. And honestly, with what 
students will be studying and here colleges will be very, very impressed with this course, a lot more so than if you go to somewhere else that can give you credit, but won't you won't be reading difficult materials and the students won't actually be learning as much. All right, now, the cost for the course. Um, so it's $250 a semester or $500 total if you audit it and $300 a semester uh, graded or $600 total. Now, I know that is a steep price, but you are getting, I mean, really 50 to 100 hours of content here in video. So it's very much worth the money, I think. And if you are taking it graded as a high school student and this price is too steep, please contact me and we can discuss possibly giving a scholarship for it. Uh, you can also join the uh, Meaning of Catholic Guild and get 10% off the uh, course. Now, you can also take semesters individually if you can't afford to take both semesters. Uh, but I do recommend that you take both semesters because they do build upon one another. Uh, and also, if you would like additional private tutoring, you can contact me as well for that if you're having trouble with anything. Um, now, there is a schedule in terms of weeks, but obviously, if you're auditing the course, you can go whatever pace you would like. And if you're taking it for a grade and this schedule doesn't work for you, you can reach out to me as well and I can change the due dates for tests and papers. All right, now I'm gonna give a brief overview of what will actually be taught in the class, what we're reading each week. This is subject slightly to change. I might change which books we're reading and, or which chapters rather we're reading, what um, excerpts from it and so on, but this is pretty closely going to be the final syllabus. So the first unit, we're going to be looking at politics in the classical world. Uh, we're going to be primarily focused here on Aristotle because he was held as the philosopher in the scholastic era. And really, you cannot understand fully the teachings of the church without studying Aristotle. Um, so the first week, we're going to look at his teachings on virtue and justice. And if you want to see that lecture, stick around after we're done going over the syllabus, and I will be including that first lecture. And I'm going to be discussing his view of friendship, because friendship for Aristotle is the foundation of politics. They're going to be going through uh, the politics by Aristotle. We're going to be going through six of the eight books. I cut out the book on where he's analyzing different Greek um, political forms and where he's discussing education, because those aren't directly relevant to what we're doing, although I do highly recommend you go back and read those at some point. We're primarily going to focus on his political theory, and then we're briefly going to look at uh, Polybius, who was a Greek author who was very interested in Rome as Rome was rising, and he looks at the Roman constitution. This is going to be important because Roman law became foundational to a lot of the medieval era, and also the Roman Republic was very inspirational to the founding fathers. All right. In the second unit, we're going to be uh, turning and looking at St. Augustine, as St. Augustine is now sees uh, the Christian vision of politics, and he sees this Greco-Roman vision of politics, and he's trying to look at where is the good in this model of Rome, and where is the bad, and what exactly is the Christian model of what a policy, a polity should look at like. So we're going to be spending three weeks on St. Augustine, and also look at uh, Duo Sunt, which was an encyclical by Pope St. Galatius, where he starts applying St. Augustine's teachings on politics to the actual political order. Um, and if you're doing this for a grade, you get to write a very interesting paper here. We're going to be comparing uh, Aristotle's classical conception of politics to St. Augustine's Christian conception of politics, because there's actually quite a bit of disagreement in scholarship on whether or not the two are in agreement and how much they are in agreement or disagreement. And so I think it'll be very interesting to give students a chance to give their own reflections on this difficult but interesting topic. And then we're going to be turning to uh, medieval politics, and we're primarily going to be focused on St. Thomas Aquinas because he is the common doctor of the church and held up as a model in both theology and philosophy. So we're going to be looking at St. Thomas Aquinas's teachings on law and also on justice and the nature, how he builds on Aristotle's conception of justice and applies it to issues in his day. 
and how he's also integrating really a biblical conception of law, a Roman conception of law, and an Aristotelian conception of nature. And he provides this really brilliant synthesis where there's four different kinds of law, eternal law, natural law, human law, and divine law. And so I think this will be a really interesting study we're going to go through. And this ultimately culminates then with St. Thomas Aquinas's analysis of the Old Testament law of Moses, where he looks in and asks, is the law that God gave to Moses a just law? And what can we learn from it in our own politics? And then we're going to be looking at um, Aquinas's letter to uh, the prince of Cyprus, where he needs advice of how he should serve as a king. And so St. Thomas takes this theory he puts forward in the treatise on law and actually applies it to a concrete vision of what it's like to be a just king. And then finally, we're going to be looking at sort of the other um, great scholastic theologian and philosopher, Blessed John John Scotus. Uh, and he has an interesting question in his ordinatio, where he asks, if a thief steals property and then they're repentant, do they have to return that property? Well, in order to answer that, he has to know what the notion of property is. In order to know the notion of property, he has to have a notion of authority. So this ultimately leads him back into the very foundations of how authority arises and what is economic justice. And so that will cap off then this first semester where we've now gone through the development of Christian theories of politics. In the second semester, we're going to be turning to modern political philosophy. So we're going to start off with a discussion of the authority of the church and challenges to the authority of the church by early Protestants. So we're going to be looking at Pope Boniface VIII's famous statement of the authority of the church over political authorities in his bull Unum Sanctum. And we're going to be looking at how Martin Luther reacts to this political order that developed throughout the Middle Ages and how he argues for the superiority in, instead of the superiority of the church, the superiority of princes even over the church. And we're going to be looking at the great early modern scholastic uh, Francisco Suarez's response to these early Protestant theories of political authority and his defense of the traditional order. I think we'll be looking at another scholastic treatment of authority in Francisco de Vitoria. Because one of the very important things that happens at this time is the discovery of the Americas. And you know, there's, a, there's all these other civilizations that already exist, and these colonial empires want to expand in there. And sort of the stereotypical version everyone has, that the church was entirely fine with colonial empires. But as we see, actually, Vittoria pushes back strongly against the Spanish Empire, despite himself being a Spanish theologian, and argues for the rights of the natives and authority as rooted within nature. We're then going to be turning to sort of a discussion of, again, the origin of states. And Scotus had touched on this a little bit in the Middle Ages, but in this early modern period, especially with the discovery of America, this becomes a much more pressing question. And so we're going to look first at a scholastic account in Suarez, in uh, De Legibus, or on laws. And then we're going to look at uh, early modern enlightenment theories uh, are known as social contract theories. And so we're going to look at Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. And then we're going to have, uh, if you're a student who is graded, a paper comparing Suarez's theory of the origin of authority to that of Hobbes and Locke. All right. Then we're going to get into, I think, a very, very interesting section, something that really every American should do, which is go through the writings of the founding fathers, both the Federalist Papers, those who wrote and supported the Constitution, and the Anti-Federalist Papers, those who were critical of the Constitution and got changes made to it, specifically the creation of the Bill of Rights. And so we're going to be looking at that and trying to understand the founding fathers, both as they drew from the Enlightenment and perhaps ideas that were not as Catholic, and also, though, drew from their classical inheritance, which is very rooted in other things the Catholic Church agrees with, or development through Catholic theology. And so I think we're going to see a 
very complex understanding of the American founding from a Catholic perspective. And really here, the purpose of this whole section is not to tell students whether or not they should support the American Constitution as Catholics. The point of this whole section is to simply get students to understand that, because I can't give them the answer to that question. I might have my own personal opinions on the matter, but as I'm teaching this course, our goal is to understand these sources, these very foundational sources, both good and bad. And then finally, after we come back from a break for Holy Week and Easter, we're going to be looking at Catholic social teaching. So we'll be looking at some selections from uh, and early encyclicals from Pius IX and Leo XIII, where they're responding to this new problem of liberalism that has arisen in society through the Enlightenment. And then we're going to be looking, they're dealing mostly with European issues in their writings. But Pope Leo XIII does write two encyclicals to America, Longinqua and Testum Benevolentiae. Uh, Benevolentia. And so we're going to be looking at these encyclicals and trying to understand what he means by Americanism. And we're actually going to have a paper for students. They're going to analyze what exactly is meant by Americanism in Leo XIII and whether or not they think it's actually a fair description of America. Um, and we're also going to be looking at then the church's teachings on liberalism as taken up by Vatican II and Gaudium et Spes and Dignitatis Humanae in discussing, did the church actually change its teachings or did it simply change its emphasis at Vatican II? Then we're going to be uh, switching gears a little bit to economics and looking at early encyclicals in economics, such as Vix Perveni, which deals with the issue of usury, uh, Rerum Novarum, and Quadrigesimo Anno. And this is dealing, though, with economic systems that are not as similar as we have today. So then we'll turn to St. John Paul II and his treatment, really, of modern economic issues as he's dealing with both socialism and capitalism. And especially, I think, Centesimus Anus is where he, the Soviet Union has just fallen. And so now he's asking the question, given that we just defeated this greater evil of socialism, how should we look at capitalism as Catholics? And this is very important. I'm going to be looking at this theme that runs through uh, two en recent encyclicals of the slaying of Abel. And I think this is a very interesting theme as it's taken up both by St. John Paul II in Evangelium Vitae, which is about pro-life issues, and is taken up by Pope Francis in Laudato Si, which is on environmental issues. And finally, we're going to wrap up the whole course, returning to really the foundational issues here, uh, looking at um, Quas Primas, which is Pope Pius XI's encyclical on the kingship of Christ, as well as Benedict XVI's encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, God is Charity, where he's looking at this theme of charity and how that should transfigure the modern political systems. And so ultimately, in this whole class, I don't just hope to, again, give my opinions on the matter. I hope we can analyze these texts and as a class wrestle with these difficult issues. So if you're interested in signing up for the course, you can sign up again with the link below in the description. Uh, and I hope to see many of you taking this course. And now stick around for the second half of this video where I'll be sharing the first lecture for free so that way you can see if this course is a good fit for you. All right, hello and welcome to week one of political philosophy. Uh, this week we're going to be taking a look at uh, books one and five of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. So if you haven't yet done the readings, um, you're welcome to watch this first part of the lecture, where we're just going to go through a general outline of what is political philosophy and what is, um, and just a little bit of background about who Aristotle is, what the Nicomachean Ethics is. But then I recommend before watching the rest of the lecture, you go back and read through books one and five of the Nicomachean Ethics, because that will provide uh, the important background information that we're going to be discussing in this lecture. So first of all, we ask, what is political philosophy? Uh, it's also sometimes called political science. And so 
before we ask that, we really need to ask, what is philosophy? Put down, here we go, philosophy. And it comes from two Greek words. Um, philia, which is a type of love. Um, and logos, so um, wis uh, wisdom. No, they're not, sorry, not logos here, from Sophia. So it's philia Sophia, the love of wisdom. And that's literally the word in Greek for um, philosophy, philosophia. And so strictly speaking, it's just the love of wisdom. So if you desire to know, if you have questions in life, right, where Aristotle, the beginning of his book, The Metaphysics, says all men by nature desire to know. God created us in his image. And so he created us with an intellect. He created us to desire to know things. As we see in uh, actually today's reading from Aristotle, right? He says most people go about their life as the animals do. They go about not desiring to know higher things, just simply trying to please their senses. But that's not what God made us for. God made us to seek higher truths. And really, all people want to know things. You can even find this in the simplest workers. They will often have very profound questions about the nature of reality, the meaning of life. And so in philosophy, we're pursuing the answers to these sorts of questions. Um, and another way we can understand philosophy is what uh, can be known by reason. Known by reason. So philosophy, strictly speaking, is different from theology. Because in theology, we pick up and take up questions that we could not have had the answer to had God not revealed them to us. So we couldn't know that God is a trinity or that God became incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ and died for our sins. That sort of knowledge is not known by reason. And that sort of knowledge can only be had by God giving that to us. And so philosophy, we set aside those truths. Now, philosophy and theology are closely related to one another. Theology can help guide and correct the mistakes we make in philosophy. And theology, and theology can take up and use the tools given to it by philosophy. And we actually wouldn't be able to understand most of the truths of theology if we didn't have philosophy. So even if one is interested in theological questions, it's still very important to study philosophy as the background for that. Um, traditionally, before anyone could study theology, they spent many, many years uh, studying philosophy first to get the background of it. We also sometimes call it political science. Here we go. And now, science nowadays, when we hear the word science, we think of experiments that are done. But in the scholastic sense, science comes from the Latin scientia, which means um, knowledge. And so all a science is, really, is a organized body of knowledge, really. Now, also, in the Aristotelian sense, in order for it to really be a science, it has to be certain knowledge deduced from logical principles. But nowadays, we tend to take a slightly broader view of what a science is. And I don't want to get into here what co constitutes something as a science. Uh, that's a very important question, but it's a question for the philosophy of science. And so for right now, we're just going to take science in this very general sense as an organized body of knowledge. Now, we could have many different types of sciences or philosophy, and I'm going to be using from here on philosophy and science as synonyms. And so we want to have a divisions of the sciences. Right? What are the different kinds of sciences that we could have? What sorts of knowledge could we have? And now scholastics, when I say scholastic philosophy, I mean philosophy as it was taken up and studied by Catholic philosophers in the Middle Ages. And it's not strictly speaking, just Catholic philosophers. Uh, the scholastic method was also used by Muslims, by Jews, by Protestants, it, uh, and even actually some Eastern Orthodox as well. And so the scholastic method is simply a method of approaching knowledge as it was developed and as the church has come to use it.
And so these scholastics distinguished between two forms of sciences. We have speculative and we have practical. So speculative sciences pursue knowledge in a sense almost for its own sake. There are interesting things to know, even if they don't have some sort of direct application. Now, oftentimes they do have applications, but that's not the primary reason we study them. Oh, this is a very important difference, right? Nowadays, people often go into studying things simply because they think they can get some sort of benefit from it. Uh, but we want to, when we go to study things like um, logic or metaphysics or nature, well, we first want to come to these things to understand them for their own sake, not just for some immediate application. And then we have practical sciences are those things which have some sort of benefit. So if we can then divide these up. So what examples might we have of speculative sciences? So the two primary divisions of these are rational and natural. So rational sciences would be things like uh, grammar or logic, where we're trying to understand the structure of thinking. Versus natural philosophy would be things like what used to be called physics. So we would now just call more broadly the notion of science, where we're studying uh, things in nature. We can go up to mathematics, where we're studying things more abstractly. And then also to metaphysics, where we come to study being in itself. And so rational and natural sciences are going to be applied quite a bit in philosophy. And so I'll try to fill in the background of these for those who don't have the background studies in those. Um, but that's not the primary focus of this class. Really, the primary focus of this class is the practical sciences. And really, the here we go, practical sciences. The primary branch of this is moral philosophy. So in moral philosophy, or we also call it ethics, we're trying to determine what is right action. And you notice that this is classified for the ancients and the medievals as a practical science. So this is not something that we only know how to act well because it is revealed in the Bible, right? The Bible helps give us guiding principles because we make errors in our reasoning. But that's not really the primary way in which we come to um, know moral truths. The primary source of our moral truths, as we need to study in St. Thomas Aquinas, is going to be the natural law. What is implanted within our nature? What is good for us in accord with our nature? And this is why we can turn to sources like Aristotle to study ethics, even though he was not Catholic, because the things he is saying is in accord with natural reason. And so it's good, regardless of whether or not it comes directly from the Bible. And this is, I think, an important thing to consider nowadays, right? Because you'll have people nowadays who will say, I'm not religious, so I don't have to follow these moral teachings. And we can say, all right, you know, we can talk about things like the existence of God, like the Catholic faith, and so on. But let's set those aside for now. What do those things have to do with acting well as a human? There are certain things that are good in accord for us with our nature, and certain things that are not in accord with our nature. And so we turn to reasoning through moral philosophy to know what is good in accord with our nature and what is not. Um, and within then moral philosophy, we might consider sort of three general areas of moral philosophy. So we can consider individual ethics. And so we're thinking of individual ethics. We're thinking of what is good for me according to my nature, or what is good for that person in accord with their nature. We can also have um, what you might call a domestic ethics. It may be societal. Uh, traditionally, it was called economics. But this is, since economics nowadays tends to be associated with um, systems of money, 
this might not be the best name for it anymore. But this is essentially when we're considering ethics when we relate to those around us in different communities, right? So the primary foundational community of society is the family, because this is how people come to be, how they grow up in the world and so on. And then people come to relate in other societies, they join workplaces, they join communities and so on and so forth. And all these different communities then are united within a larger community, which is the political society. And so this is where political philosophy now comes in. It's a branch of moral philosophy. And this is why we're going to go back and study some of Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics, because we have to understand moral philosophy and ethics if we are going to understand political philosophy, where we actually apply ethics as we are living in a political community. Now, this word political as well, this comes from the Greek word polis, which is a city. And for the ancient Greeks, they lived in what were called city-states. So every individual city was its own government as well. And this was the system that Aristotle grew up in, which he lived in for most of his life. And it's actually one of Aristotle's students, Alexander the Great, who built the first Greek empire, where he went and conquered most of the known world. Um, and Aristotle, when he's writing the politics, is not really considering uh, what Alexander the Great will eventually do. He's considering in his own day what is the political arrangement, which is individual city-states. And so... This creates an interesting difficulty in reading Aristotle, because what's often translated in Aristotle as state or government or so on, and Aristotle will be the word polis, which means something closer to a city. But it doesn't just mean a city, because the city is also their political society. And so this can be a difficult concept to easily translate out of the Greek of Aristotle into a good English word. This is ultimately where we get the word uh, political from them, because Aristotle is going to title his book on political philosophy, uh, Politikos, about politics and the polis. Right. So what is now a definition of political philosophy? So it could be useful for us to have some sort of definition that we are working by, so we know exactly what is covered by this subject. Here we go. Um, so I'm drawing this definition here from a manual by Henri Grenier, who was a very good uh, Thomistic, um, Thomistic is in the sense of following St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, philosopher, and he wrote a very detailed treatment of philosophy in four volumes, and when he's talking about political philosophy, he gives us the definition that it is the practical science which considers human acts. So we're considering different acts that human persons do as directed to the common good of civil society. This is going to be an important concept we're going to have to take up is what is the common good um, and of a civil society? Because we can have the common good of a family where everyone in the family benefits. But we're considering now the common good as it relates to everyone within a civil society so within a government essentially not and not just the government but also the people who live under the government as well uh, and we could also define it as the science which deals with man in his life in civil society so as we live in uh, within civil society i slightly prefer this first definition because i think it includes the purpose of politics, which is ultimately the common good. But we can only understand the common good uh, in light of the human acts that are ordered to that common good. All right. So now we consider the first author we're going to treat, who is Aristotle. Now, Aristotle was a Greek philosopher who lived from the years 384 to 322 before Christ. So he was born before the time of Jesus Christ. If people are wondering where this relates to in the time of the Holy Scriptures. This would be slightly, um, or really probably right around or slightly after the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And those are going on in the Persian kingdoms. But at the same time in Greece, uh, we're getting the birth of philosophy. 
And so many early Greek philosophers taking up really themes that had come in from other um, more ancient civilizations than Greece, trying to ask questions about the nature of existence. And this was taken up especially by a philosopher named Socrates. And we only know about the teachings of Socrates from his students, and most notably his student Plato. And Plato went and founded actually a school for the study of philosophy called the Academy. And so Aristotle was born in Macedon, but he moves from, and Macedon is in sort of northern Greece, and they saw themselves as Greek, but other Greeks did not see them as really being Greek. And so Aristotle goes from Macedon to Athens, which is the center of philosophy at the time. And he goes and he studies with Plato in Athens at the academy. But Aristotle actually comes to, even though he benefits a lot from the teachings of Plato, he also comes to disagree with many of the teachings of Plato. And he goes and sets out many of his own teachings. And Aristotle writes on pretty much every topic under the sun. He talks about logic. He talks about grammar. He talks about biology. He talks about physics. He talks about metaphysics. He talks about ethics. If you can name a topic, he probably writes on even astronomy. Um, and he's trying to really bring together all that can be known by human reason and trying to work through it in a rational order, applying the rules of logic. And he's really the first one to write down systematically the rules of logic. And even in the 1800s, the philosopher Immanuel Kant said that there's really nothing to add to the study of logic after Aristotle. I mean, other people are refining little details here and there about logic, but it's pretty amazing. The first person to write down the rules of logic gets it pretty much all right, right away. And so he's just very, very foundational to um, the study of everything in philosophy because he writes so much. Now, unfortunately, whereas Plato wrote very beautiful works that are nice to read, all we have surviving from Aristotle are what are essentially lecture notes. Um, and so that's why if you're reading Aristotle and you think he's very difficult at times to read, it's because he's coming at it from, well, he probably would have been a great teacher. We know he was a great teacher. He inspired many wonderful students who wrote their own works. But unfortunately, he was not a great writer from what we have surviving of him. And so sometimes he can be difficult to read. But once you start to understand his, his um, writing style and the principles of his philosophy, he actually becomes very clear and very wonderful to study. And his works were very, very influential in uh, both Greece and Rome. And they were widely spread and widely read but they were never actually fully translated ever into Latin. Only some of his logical works were actually translated into Latin. And so was anyone who was educated at the time in Rome and philosophy would have actually studied philosophy in Greek. Um, and even if they might have written in Latin, the language of philosophy was always Greek. And so when the Roman Empire fell, knowledge of Latin in the West was, or knowledge of Greek rather in the West was mostly lost. And so most people were not able to read the works of Aristotle. Now when the uh, Muslims came and they conquered much of the Greek speaking world, uh, many gr um, Christians knew now both Greek and Arabic and actually translated many of the works of Aristotle from Greek into Arabic. And then because of contact between the Arabic world and the Latin world, many of these works of Aristotle came to actually enter the medieval West through um, these Arabic works. And so they were actually translated initially from Arabic into Latin. And then people went back and translated them from the original Greeks. So they could be more accurate. And so along with the study of the actual works of Aristotle it was also brought in many commentaries on Aristotle by Muslims. And these were taken up and highly praised in the uh, Christian world. Uh, the works of Avicenna and Averroes on philosophy and their commentaries on Aristotle were highly, highly prized in the Christian world. Because, right, again, these are things that we can know by reason. We're looking at what can be known by reason. And so simply because, as something that was true was written down by Aristotle, who was a pagan, or by Avicenna or Averroes, who were uh, Muslims, or by Maimonides, who was Jewish, doesn't mean that we as Catholics can't receive that and use that positively. 
Uh, these things, they're written, they're true. And so we should receive them because they're true. And all truth ultimately comes from God, who is the source of all things. And so we should accept them and love that we have these great works. And Aristotle, so when his works first entered the West, they were actually highly suspect. And the reason is, is because Aristotle seemed to have the answers to everything already. And so there was a big question then of what is the point of the Christian faith anymore if Aristotle can just give us all the answers to everything? There's a lot of questions of should we use Aristotle? And Aristotle was actually brought into the medieval curriculum, especially by a few important writers, especially St. Albert the Great, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, and Alexander of Hales. So these first two were Dominican theologians, and the last one is a Franciscan theologian. And they came in, they thought the works of Aristotle should in fact be studied, because what they contain is true. And so St. Albert and St. Thomas went and tried to harmonize everything in Aristotle with the teachings of the Catholic faith, or those things, or a few spots where they thought it was contrary to either refute Aristotle or say he isn't necessarily in contradiction to the faith. So one area where he seemed to be in contradiction is that Aristotle held that the world was eternal and that it was not created. And so St. Thomas Aquinas thought simply that perhaps we can't prove the world is created, but there's nothing in Aristotle that says it wasn't created either. You simply can't prove it one way or the other. And there was other theologians who were more skeptical of Aristotle, most notably um, St. Bonaventure. Here we go. So St. Bonaventure was a fellow professor at the University of Paris, along with St. Thomas Aquinas, and was a student of Alexander of Hales. And he ultimately did come to accept that Aristotle should be integrated into the um, curriculum, but that he needs to be treated a bit more critically as well. And the teachings of St. Bonaventure were then developed by another Franciscan theologian, Blessed John Duns Scotus, who was much more willing to accept Aristotle, but to critically engage with him and say, all right, maybe he's right here, maybe he's wrong here. And the church has never actually settled a lot of these disputes. And why? Because a lot of the disputes that were going on now weren't matters of the faith. They were matters of what can be known by reason. And so Catholics are free to hold different opinions on the truths of different propositions in Aristotle. But what all these different people agree on is the importance of studying Aristotle, because so much of what he has is true. And even where he is wrong, he can teach us so much in knowing how he is wrong. And we can learn a lot from that. And actually, when Aristotle was in the curriculum, he was known by the title of the philosopher. So if you ever see in a medieval writing, just someone's referred to the philosopher, they're referring to Aristotle, because he was held as the highest of all the philosophers and the most perfect of all of them. And actually, St. Thomas Aquinas wrote very, very wonderful commentaries on the works of Aristotle. He wrote them on uh, one on the Nicomachean Ethics in full that you can use, and one on the first three books of the politics. But unfortunately, he stopped after partway through book three of the politics. But if you're ever stuck on the meaning of um, a something in Aristotle, I highly recommend turning to the commentaries of St. Thomas Aquinas, because he explains Aristotle very clearly, and he was a very, very wonderful teacher. All right, now, the two main works we're going to be looking at of Aristotle in this class are the Nicomachean Ethics and the Politics. I spell misspell McKeon here. There we go. All right, yeah, Nick, be careful you spell Nick McKeon there. Um, difficult word. But um, this first work, the Nick McKeon Ethics, was written to his son about how to live as a virtuous person. And so he simply explores, from what can be known by reason, how is it best to live as a human? And the politics, he takes it up and applies this to political philosophy. But many of the things he discusses in the Nicomachean Ethics, most especially related to the purpose of ethics and the nature of justice, are going to be very foundational to the issues we're going to treat in the politics. So it's important that we study those. And ideally, if we had the time, we'd read all of the Nicomachean Ethics before reading the politics. And really, you should do that. But for the purposes of this class, we'll only be looking at portions of the politics.
All right, so now at this point, if you haven't yet read the text, I highly recommend you go read books one and five of the Nicomachean Ethics, because now we will be turning to analyzing those texts. All right, so we have here in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics, and as the link as I have it on Google Classroom is to this list of works by Aristotle, on the MIT library, because these are all in the public domain, they're older translations. And so we can just take a look at all the different types of works that Aristotle wrote. Wrote a commentary on the constitution of Athens, on issues of logic, on memory, and so on and so forth. And so the one we're gonna be looking at here is the Nicomachean Ethics. Where is that one? Here we go, Nicomachean Ethics. You can see there's the 10 book works with me looking at book one. All right, and so all I'm going to be doing here is giving a brief overview of the text. I'm going to assume you have read the text as we're doing this, and so we're not going to go through every word of Aristotle. We're just going to be trying to give a general overview of the, um, the meaning of the text and the implications of it. And something you should always be thinking about as we're going through these, right? We're dealing with practical science, how it can apply to our own lives. And so we should be thinking in our own lives about how these principles of ethics that Aristotle is laying out can teach us about how we can act ethically. So at the very beginning of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle brings up that every art and every action and pursuit is thought to aim at some good. Right? We don't do things for no reason. We always do things with some end in mind. Right? And this end is what Aristotle calls the good. And he actually defines the good as that at which all things aim. All things are moving towards the good. And actually in the metaphysics, Aristotle takes this principle up more generally and asks, what is the purpose of the movement of the whole universe? And he says, the whole universe is moving towards God ultimately. Obviously, Aristotle doesn't have a well-fleshed out Christian conception of what it means for God to exist, but he has a general conception of what can be known by reason. And so he sees there must be some highest principle of the good, and that everything in the world is moving out of this love of the good. Um, and so now he's saying, right, the good is that which, that which all things aim. He says, but a certain difference is found among ends. And he's going to distinguish now two kinds of ends for which we, um, or before he does that, he says there's many different types of actions we could do, right? So if we want health, what do we need? We need to know medical art. If we want to know, um, we want to build a vessel, we're going to need shipbuilding and so on and so forth. There's all these different arts that we're going to need to aim at some sort of good. And then the second paragraph now, he's going to deal with um, the distinctions between types of goods that we might pursue. And he's going to make two essential types of goods that we might pursue. We have goods that we do for the sake of something else, and we have goods that are done for their own end. Right? So, there are um, some end of things we do, which we desire for its own sake, and everything else is desired for the sake of this, right? So there must be some final good that we desire. And why is that? Um, because if not, he says, that uh, rate process would go on to infinity so that our desire would be empty in vain. There must be some chief good at which we are aiming, right? So you can think about it this way, right? Let's say you're going to do a job. Well, why are you doing that job? Well, you're doing that job to make money. Are you doing that job to, are you getting that money for its own sake? Well, obviously you want that money to buy something with it. Well, why do you want that thing that you're buying? And we could go on, right? If there's no end to these questions of why, there will be no final reason that we're doing everything for. And so he's now going to want to ask, what is it that we're doing all things for? What is this final end that we are aiming at? 
um, and Aristotle is going to say here that um, the final end that we are aiming at here is political philosophy here. Oh, and his reasoning for this is that for even if the end is the same for every single man and that of the state, the state and the state here being the polis seems that all events greater and more complete, whether to attain or to preserve. He's saying, right, the end at which all of us are pursuing for each of us is the same. But when we consider it generally as a whole community, he's going to say that this is in some sense higher because it includes not just the good for the individual, but the good for everyone. This is what Aristotle is ultimately going to say is the common good. It's a good that which we as a whole society are aiming at. It must be a common good. To go back to the definition of what politics is. And it's notable for Aristotle, though, that politics is the highest good. Notice it's not for Aristotle theology, which is the highest good, because he only has what is known by reason. He doesn't have what is known by faith. And so for him, ultimately, it's the city, which is the end of all things. And when I say end here, I don't mean as in the stopping of all things, but the purpose of all things. And so this is going to be the highest thing in the ancient world. It's to die for one's country, to live for one's country, to do everything for one's country, because that's the highest possible good. And so this is obviously an area where Aristotle has a more limited conception. Now, he has a very, very important pushback, though, to modern conceptions of politics, wherein the modern view generally is that the city exists, the state exists, in order to protect the individual goods of people. And that's not the purpose of politics for Aristotle. The purpose of politics for Aristotle is the common good of everyone, not just the protections of individual good. There is some real good which the whole society aims at. And we could even notice, right, we're already at just chapter book one, chapter two. And Aristotle calls these paragraphs chapters here. At chapter two here, that um, we're already discussing politics here. So Aristotle, really the whole purpose of the study of ethics is for the sake of politics. Ethics forms people as good individuals, but they only are good individuals for the sake of the larger society that they're in. All right. Now, in the third paragraph here, he's going to ask, right, so now we know that politics is this greatest end. We haven't actually really determined what the end is. You know, there's some sort of good which politics is pursuing, some sort of common good, which must be the end of all actions here. And he hasn't even fully justified that. He's just said, well, it seems to be greater than the good of the individual. But we haven't fully gotten a proof of that yet. But now he wants to ask, so what sort of proofs are we going to give in political philosophy. Well, he first says, um, points out that um, now fine and just actions, which political science investigates, admit much variety of fluctuation in opinion. And so they might be thought to exist only by convention and not by nature. So Aristotle brings up the opinion that many people have that considering good in politics is only by convention. So there is no, make this distinction here between nature and convention, first of all. Nature is something which is in accord with human nature. What is right for human beings apart from personal opinions versus convention is simply what are people's opinions or how have we done things? And so Aristotle says where well, a lot of people think that because not every government is the same or the situations might vary, that there isn't any sort of nature of politics. There isn't anything that's in accord with human nature. And so we can't really be investigating this from a um, perspective of philosophy. We're trying to use a logical discussion into the natures of things. But he seems to say that there are some things which are more general rules, right? So maybe not every individual answer is by nature. There's a lot of things that are going to require, as he points out, 
um, that we need people to be a good judge in order to apply the virtue of prudence in individual situations. That's going to be one of the virtues Aristotle takes up in the Nicolaitan ethics. And so we're going to need a man who is well-educated in many things in order to um, be able to understand um, how to run a good society in order to be a good politician. But uh, there does seem to be certain things that are in accord with nature as well, even if many practical applications are in accord with convention. Um, and so he says, since many things are going to be by convention, we have to look for the sorts of proofs that are in accord with nature. What sorts of things do we find universally? And so Aristotle even actually spends one of the books, The Politics, which is unfortunately not one we're going to be able to read in this class, looking through all the different sorts of um, political systems he sees in the Greek world at the time and different theories that people had come up with of what governments should be like to try and understand what seems to be universal in uh, politics by human nature and what things seem to be by convention and what things have worked well by convention and what things haven't. And this says we need to find the right types of system of proof for this. And he makes a good point that um, right, he says it is evidently equally foolish to accept probable reasoning from a mathematician and to demand from a rhetorician scientific proofs. Right. So within a math class, you want logical proofs where the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. And you can't just say, I think there's a 90% chance this answer is correct in math. Now, that would not be acceptable in math. You need certain proofs. But if we're discussing rhetoric, how to speak well, you wouldn't uh, demand from a rhetorician that they give you the same sort of proof you would find in mathematics, because you can't have something like that in rhetoric. You simply look at what works well in practice when you're speaking. And so when we're going to be discussing politics, we have to see what things in practice seem to work well in accord with human nature, what sort of political systems work well. And we can't simply be seeking uh, simply what is logical in the same degree that we would seek as precision in mathematics. And this is a big, I think, issue today is that we tend to demand that all sciences be after the model of mathematics, because mathematics has been such a successful field. And we want everything to look like mathematics. And simply some fields are not like mathematics. And so we can't demand mathematical proofs from fields that aren't mathematics. This also, I think, doesn't make the field less legitimate. I mean, ethics is ultimately dealing with things that are more important than mathematics, uh, even if we can't get to the same sorts of arguments that we might in math. Right. Going on then to chapter four. Uh, and also one thing I should note on chapter three here is an interesting point he makes, which presents a challenge to teaching this as a high school course, where he says, hence a young man is not a proper hearer of lectures in political science, for he is inexperienced in actions that occur in life, but its discussions start from these and are about these. And further, since he tends to follow his passions, his study will be in vain and unprofitable, because the end is aimed at uh, not knowledge, but action. Right? And so what is Aristotle saying here? He's saying we need to know all sorts of different things to uh, be to be able to study political science. And we also need to, since it's dealing with, a, it's a practical science, it deals with practical ends, we have to have control over our passions, right? Our desires for things. We need to be able to do that, to act ethical. And uh, we also need lots of practical experience in life in order to really understand politics. And so these are things, unfortunately, that... You're not, if you're taking this now as a high schooler, I'm sure there are many, many things in this class that you will not understand. So why study this now? Still, if Aristotle says that really we should wait till later to study this. Well, I think it's important that you are familiar with the general principles now, because as you develop in life, you're going to return to these texts. The goal of this class is not to simply read these texts once so that you never have to read them again. These are works that you should return to again and again and again in your life, because these are works of great, great value, of great wisdom that have been passed down through thousands of years. This book is 2,300 years old. 
And people for 2,300 years have been returning to this book to get wisdom about how to act ethically and how to be a good politician. And so we want to get a general overview so we know what's in the text. So that way later on, let's say years later, you're now dealing with very serious issues in your life. You can return to these works and you'll know where to look to find the answers to your questions. All right, so now let's look then at um, chapter four here. So now he's asking, all right, so if there is um, some sort of end at which our actions end, going back to that discussion from chapter two there, he asks, what is this end? And he says, verbally, there is general agreement for both the general run of men and people of superior refinement say it is happiness and identify living well and doing well with being happy, All right? So what does he mean here by happiness? The word here he's using for happy here is a Greek word, here we go, of eudaimonia. So literally this word in Greek means something like well-being, right? But there's no good translation of it really to English. So we say tend to say happiness, but we really shouldn't reduce happiness in Aristotle to simply a feeling of pleasure. And actually, Aristotle takes up a whole book of the Nicomachean Ethics to argue against the idea, and he's going to spend quite a while here as well, arguing against the idea that pleasure is to be identified with happiness. Happiness is a sort of well-being of the soul. And um, he says, basically, everyone agrees it's happiness. And why is it happiness? So let's go back to our example of or you're working a job. Why are you working a job to get money? Why are you getting money to buy things? Why are you getting money, buying things? Well, it's to provide for what you need in this life. And why do you want to provide for what you need? Well, you need that a certain amount of material goods, such as food, water, shelter, and so on, in order to be able to pursue higher goods, right? If you are hungry, you're not going to be able to think well as you're trying to study, as you're trying to pursue higher goods, as you're trying to act ethically, and so on. So ultimately, all of you're trying to pursue some sort of higher good, this higher good of well-being. But why do we pursue this well-being, this happiness? Well, it's not for any sort of, sort of higher good, according to Aristotle. It is the good itself. This is the thing we are pursuing, is this well-being, this happiness. We just do happiness for its own sake, right? And even people who aren't pursuing um, some higher good, that's something Aristotle's going to deal with, they're ultimately doing it for happiness, right? So maybe for someone, they identify happiness with simply pleasure, and they put pleasure as the highest good. Well, ultimately, still then, they are pursuing some sort of good. It's simply that that good is to be identified for them with pleasure and nothing higher, and that is for them happiness. And so they are still pursuing happiness. And so Aristotle is going to ask, what can we identify it with? And he says, for the former thing. And if we go back to the general, to the two groups of people he's discussing here, he identifies the general run of people. So most people and people of superior refinement. So people who are actually trying to pursue seriously philosophy. And he says, most people identify happiness with some plain and obvious thing like pleasure, wealth, or honor. And they differ from one another, right? So um, when someone is ill, they think health is the best thing they could possibly have. When someone's poor, they think wealth is the best possible thing they could have, and so on. Right? And so when we're reading Aristotle also, we need to remember this, that Aristotle is not the average Greek in his day. Right? We sometimes look back and we only read the best works from that time. And so we think oh, they were so much better in those days. They seriously studied philosophy like this. But we can go back to Aristotle and we can see most people back then, just as now, simply pursued material goods. They did not think about higher things. They didn't try and exercise their rationality. Um, here we go. But he says, um, they admire those who proclaim some great ideal that is above their comprehension, right? So even people who are just of the common run of people, 
are going to be sometimes they say oh i like the philosophical ideas but they haven't understood them actually that's an important thing that we actually want to understand the philosophical ideas we're talking about there's a very fine line oftentimes between us stating philosophical conclusions as though we understood what they mean and actually being able to understand what they mean. And our goal in this class is not to be able to repeat the words of Aristotle, but to actually understand what he means. That's very, very important. Here we go. And now he says, um, right, there are people who do think of higher things though. And he says, we can't examine every opinion, right? So as every possible opinion someone could have come up with about what happiness is. And so he's going to argue against those that are either very common or there's very good arguments for them, even if he ultimately thinks there are better arguments against them. Um, right now he brings up a discussion of metaphysics, really. That's sort of off topic of this course, but just so you have an understanding of what he's talking about here. He makes a distinction about arguing from or to first principles. So first principles are sort of the logical things that we're assuming that we're arguing everything else to. These are things that are either difficult to prove or can't really be proved, that are really foundational, though, to everything else we're going to believe. And so for Aristotle, ultimately we don't have immediate access to the first principles of things, right? So he says, well, we know we're pursuing the good. This seems to be some first principle we have a pretty immediate access to, but we don't seem to know what that good is, even though what that good is seems to be a first principle. And so he says, we're not gonna have immediate access to those. The way our mind works for Aristotle is that we have, it's through what's called abstraction, where we examine what's out in the world around us. And then we work back from what we can experience to the first principles. And this was this big disagreement with Plato, because Plato thought we were born with an innate sense of uh, truth. And so the goal of our life was to rediscover this truth. But um, for Aristotle, we were trying to um, look or at the world around us, to examine the world around us and come to what is true. That's very important to do. Because it's very easy for us to think that something is self-evident and it's just obviously logically true. That turns out not to be. And so looking at the world around us can help to correct our wrong assumptions. Right. And so he says, well, and how are we going? To, it's going to be difficult, right, for us to actually come and know those first principles and if we have to work back to them. And it says, hence anyone who is... Uh, to listen intelligently to lectures about what is noble and just, which is what we're doing by reading Aristotle, and generally about the political sciences, must have been brought up in good habits. Right? In order to be able to study this in the first place, we need to have good habits that are going to enable us to focus and study. These are difficult things to study. They can take many years of study to really understand. And so... He's saying we need to have to first develop those good habits before we can really have them. And really the best way to develop them is to grow up with them. Oh, you notice he'll often sometimes quote the words of different Greek poets. So here he quotes Hesiod, a famous Greek poet. And um, just like we have right, the Holy Scriptures, uh, the Bible, which we often quote to get wisdom from. You know, right, as theology can help inform us even about philosophy. Um, Aristotle did not have the answers that God had revealed yet. So he went to the great sources of his day, which was the poets. And so he has this great line here from Hesiod, where he says, far best is he who knows all things himself. Good he that hearkens when men counsel right, but he who knows neither nor lays to heart another man's wisdom is a useless white. So what does this mean? Well, he's saying that best is you already know everything, but if you don't know everything, well, what you should be doing is listening to those who do know things, right? Because um, those of us who are studying this, right, we don't know as much about many of these things as Aristotle does. So we're going to someone who has studied this, who has thought about the principles and going to the master. Uh, you're not coming to me to learn about political philosophy from me. You're coming here to learn it from Aristotle. And so we want to go to Aristotle and what Aristotle is going to teach us.
And so we want to hearken to it. And he says right here, another wisdom is a useless white. So we want to learn, actually try and understand and take to heart what Aristotle is teaching here, right? What wisdom to us, and you could say all these things to another person who's not studying them, and it's going to be completely useless to them. All right, going on then to um, chapter five here. He's considering here what kinds of lives people lead. And he says there's essentially three kinds of lives, which he lists, right? Um, and he says, most men and men of the of vulgar type seem not without some ground to identify the good or happiness with pleasure, which is the reason why they love the life of enjoyment, right? Most people are going to just pursue whatever makes them happy, whatever is pleasurable to them, whatever makes them happy, not in a sense of well-being, but simply whatever seems to them to be the best, whatever makes them feel good at the time. And that's how most people go about living their lives. But he says there's two other kinds of lives as well. There's the political life and the contemplative life. So the political life is where we're considering, this is how most um, people who are pursuing the good are going to be ordered out. For Aristotle, the political life is a good thing. This is going to be seeking the good of the whole society, which for Aristotle is the highest good. And then he also lists, though, a third kind of life, which is the contemplative life. This is quite interesting, right? Because Aristotle did not have the truth of the gospel. He did not have theology. He didn't know that you could contemplate on these higher truths of um, theology, right? But there, he did still know, right, that there's many things that are speculative sciences, that there are still things we can contemplate about the nature of being, about mathematical truths, about God as he can be known by reason. And think about, right, him versus modern society, right? Because most people nowadays who are going away from a Christian contemplative life or who, who shun away the spiritual life, they don't go and try to pursue some sort of contemplative life. They simply pursue what makes them happy. And Aristotle, without even knowing about theology in the first place, says there is some sort of contemplative life people can pursue. And people in the ancient world did this, where they'd go away from society and try to contemplate on the good. And this is really what Aristotle's devoted his life to, a contemplative life where he's trying to understand the nature of truth. And it is quite fascinating that that exists even without the gospel, just simply in the state of nature. He points out, now the mass of mankind are evidently quite slavish in their tastes, pursuing, referring a life suitable to beasts. Right. So uh, he gives an example of a certain type of group, group of people in Greece who would act this way, where they just act... Um, like animals, essentially, right? Because we as humans, we were created with a rational intellect that we can understand higher things. We can think abstractly. But the animals, they don't think abstractly. They simply follow their passions. They run away from things they're scared of, and they go towards things they desire without thinking about it. And as humans, we have the passions as well. But are, we are supposed to not be ruled by them. We're supposed to be ruled by our intellect. But most people simply rule are ruled by their passions. And it's important to know when Aristotle says most men here, he's not saying most people um, are stuck that way, that most people can't do that. No, he thinks everyone or most people, he's going to talk about some people he thinks who maybe don't have the intellect to pursue it. And ultimately that course was not accept, followed by um, the church, right? We think that people are made in the image of God by their nature. Everyone has the ability to do this. Now, not everyone is, is given by God the same intellect, right? Some people are naturally more gifted at others and are able to understand these things better than others. And that's perfectly okay. God created things with a certain hierarchy in the universe of goods. But everyone, insofar as they are human, 
is able to pursue this. If you're not able to do this for the ancients, they thought if you you were an animal, if you weren't able to do it, right? Is you act just that, that doesn't mean you can do it on your first try that it's easy. No, it's these are difficult things to learn, but you will be able to do it if you apply yourself and you apply the intellect that God gave you. And so ultimately, the reason most people are acting like animals is not out of the fact that they are unable in their intellects to pursue these things, but simply because they choose that it's a lot easier to follow your desires than it is to give up your desires and focus on higher things. Mm. Then he considers... um the political life. And he says, a consideration of prominent types of life so that people of superior refinement and active disposition identify happiness with honor. For this is roughly speaking, the end of political life, right? Considering some sort of um, good, some sort of honor that they're getting from politics. But he's saying, this seems uh, too superficial to be what we are looking for since uh, it is thought to depend on those who bestow honor rather than him who deceive, receives it. But, um, the good we divine to be something proper to man and not easily taken from him. So it's Aristotle saying it some sense could be honor, but honor is not really what we're identifying with happiness because honor, right, is simply almost subjective. It's what other people give to you. But he's saying there's some sort of good that's much more inherent than honor even. And he goes on trying to figure out here, what is it? And he says, well, what can't be taken? He says, further, men seem to pursue honor in order that they may be assured of their goodness, at least by men of practical wisdom, that they be honored among them. But, so it seems to be some sort of... Um, let's see, that honor is sought after by people, right? And so it's not the good in itself. Honor ultimately is assures you of your good, but it's not the good itself. And he says, well, what is that good then? And he says, well, the reason people are honored is on account of virtue. And so virtue is going to be much more closer to what we're getting at, that people need to be formed in virtue in order to be happy. And he thinks that, uh, and perhaps one might even suppose this rather than honor to be the end of the political life. This is the purpose of politics to be virtuous. So we're getting very, very close to it. But he points out that no, this seems to be incomplete. Right? Um, because it seems to be that uh, right, if we have virtue, we can still have virtue, he says, with being asleep or lifelong inactivity. Virtue is simply the disposition to be able to do what is good. And so um, he's saying ultimately it's going to have to be some sort of higher good. And virtue disposes us to be able to live well. But he's going to say ultimately happiness is this living well. And then finally, he sort of notes here, he was going to set aside the contemplative life for another time. And he takes that up later in the Nicomachean Ethics, which we're not going to be looking at here as much. And of course, since um, because of theology, of course, we have much more profound teachings about the contemplative life than what Aristotle could reach by reason. Then he discusses, what about the life of money making, right? This is very, very common today of what people consider the good. It's, oh, I just want to be as rich as possible. And he says, basically, this is just so obviously wrong, because why do we only make money for the sake of something else? Right? Money should never be pursued for its own sake. And so obviously, things are disordered if we're loving money for its own sake and not some sort of end. All right, then he considers this long section in chapter six. This is a difficult idea, because he's really here discussing more metaphysics than he is discussing politics strictly. He's trying to consider metaphysically what is the good. And the Platonists, and that Platonists were, since Plato was a very, very formative influence on Aristotle and those around him, uh, Platonism was very, very common in his day. And so Aristotle spends a lot of time responding to Platonism because he thinks they get so close to the truth. And many of his closest friends are Platonists. And 
the Platonists have this idea that there is this form of the good, that somewhere out there in the universe, there is this thing called the good. And um, Aristotle rejects this on metaphysical grounds, that there isn't something out there that's the good. The good is ultimately something that we're aiming at, but it isn't some sort of thing that exists in the world for Aristotle. I mean, this, um, but what then do we mean by the good? And he considers goods are analogical, that um, goods are good with respect to some sort of certain ends, right? So if I'm working a job in order to make money, that money is the good, because that's what I am aiming at at that time. Right? If we go back to the beginning here, his definition of the good is um, that at which all things aim. So if we're aiming for it, and we're aiming for it rightly, that our actions are rightly ordered, that that is, for Aristotle here, the good. And he's just here rejecting a very platonic notion of the good. And if you don't understand that fully, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it, because he is simply here... Um, dealing really more with metaphysics. And so in a class about metaphysics, we would take up to what extent are the Platonists right, to what extent is Aristotle right, and so on and so forth, and the more developed teachings that came about in the scholastic period on this question. And so when we're studying Aristotle here, we're just going to sort of assume his view of what it is to be the good. Just like when we read other authors here, we're going to assume their version of the good so that we can understand what they're aiming at then. All right, so now he takes up this question in chapter seven here about what is the good. He's trying to really understand much more deeply. He says, all right, the good seems to be good with respect to some certain ends, and we know the end of our actions is happiness. So what really is this? Right. And he points out that all these things that are um, sought after as people, or people will seek after things like uh, honor, pleasure, um, virtue, all these sorts of things as happiness. And he says that um, these things are necessary preconditions for happiness, that we need these things in order to be happy. Um, but really, all of these things are giving us the predispositions for it, right? So, and why does he even say that we need some of these things? Well, we need to be virtuous. For Aristotle, happiness is this well-being. So, it's probably best that we're not in a very painful state, because then we're going to be focused on dealing with that pain. So, it would probably be good that we're in a generally pleasurable state. And we don't want to be overly focused on pleasure, but pleasure is not in itself a bad thing. Well, enough that we need to be able to think well, we need to be able to be virtuous, we need all these things that allow us to be living well for Aristotle. And now, a big point he has is that happiness, he says, is self sufficient. And this means that happiness is not something for Aristotle that we're seeking after for the sake of another thing. We're seeking after um, happiness for its own sake. Right. happiness is something final and self-sufficient and is the end of action. It's that at which all other things are aiming. Because if happiness was for something else, well, then we're back to our initial problem that we have to be, find what is then the final good that we're seeking here. Hmm. I should note that this was not entirely rejected by the church, but the church understood then that there was some sort of higher good beyond any natural happiness we can have. There's an even higher happiness, which is the supernatural happiness of the beatific vision. Um, and also, as St. Augustine is going to point out, and we're going to deal with this later on in the class in a few months, is this issue of the notion of the good in happiness and how they can't fully be identified, that sometimes there are things that we have to pursue even above happiness, and primarily we have to seek the good for its own sake, not simply the good for our own sake. But we'll deal with that more when we come to Augustine. Right now, we just want to understand Aristotle's definition of happiness, because we can't figure out whether or not Aristotle is right or not unless we actually know what is um, happiness for him. Um. Here we go, the next page of my notes. <clears throat> 
Here you go. And um, you get to say, well, we it still seems that we want to have a more complete account of happiness. This doesn't seem to be fully um complete. And so he adds a few additional things here that can have, but he's going to say, well, we really need to return to this question. Later on, the Nicomachean ethics, uh, he returns to this question further. And so we can explore it. But he points out a few things. Um, and first of all, happiness is something unique to man. that We don't see animals as being happy. And we need... Um, some sort of rationality goes through, right? The different features of man. So we can consider for Aristotle, the um, different, what he calls the powers of the soul, different things that are in accord with life. And for Aristotle, it's important to note that the soul, and this is taken up by the church as well at the Council of Vienne, is that the soul is not like we tend to think of it now as some sort of other thing that's floating out there. The soul for Aristotle, the, um, I'm not, I can't remember what the underlying Greek word is, but it gets translated into Latin as anima, um, which means sort of living. It is the principle which makes the thing to be alive, where we get the word animated from. So the soul here is simply what makes it to be alive. So for Aristotle, plants and animals have souls as well. And so he says it's not included in life and nutrition because obviously Right? We have life in common with plants, but plants aren't happy. And likewise, animals, right? They have senses, they have the appetites and so on. But we don't describe animals as, we tend to describe them as happy in the sense of they are um, pleasured, but they aren't happy in the sense humans are, of this some sort of higher happiness, some sort of higher good that they are seeking. And so he says, we have to exclude what is unique to man. For Aristotle, it's the intellect that makes man unique. He defines man as a rational animal elsewhere. And says it's this life of the rational element, that it's our ability for our soul to have these higher virtues that we are pursuing. And it's also this well-ordering of the soul, that we have our soul in a proper order, that all the different virtues fit together properly and are in proper harmony with one another. And he also has this important note that it's, uh, we must add, in a complete life. So he says, for uh, a swallow does not make a summer, nor, um, nor does one day, so too one day or a short time does not make a man blessed or happy. All right, so if we have, um, one day that's a good that's a summery day it doesn't make it a summer with summer is a long period of time where it's summery and so if someone is virtuous or being well for a short amount of time they can't properly be called happy because it has to be a continual state of being through that person for a long amount of time and ideally for their entire life And here he's simply saying, right, the, we ultimately are going to have to come back to this later on because we would always like to um, know better of what it is. Right. And I also should probably add on here, I put it here in my notes, is when we're talking about virtue in Aristotle, it's important to note virtue here for Aristotle is a sort of seeking after excellence. It's acting well in accord with your nature, which is related to, but somewhat distinct from, the biblical notion of morality, of right and wrong. And this, as I said earlier, is an issue we're going to be taking up more when we uh, discuss St. Augustine. Uh, but we should note for now that Aristotle's not so much considering it in terms of right and wrong in the sense of morals, as we will get in Christianity, but more directly in the sense of an excellence. And that's not a bad thing. We should seek to be as virtuous and as good as we possibly can in accord with our nature. Uh, those are things are that are necessary and conducive to acting morally. Um...
here we go. Um, in chapter eight, he continues then this discussion of the relationship of happiness to the soul. And so he says that essentially happiness is going to be in the soul. And he considers sort of three types of goods here that we have external goods, we have bodily goods, and we have goods that are in accord with the soul. And so he says that there's a certain hierarchy of these goods. That the goods that are goods of the soul are the highest goods. Then we have goods that are goods for the body. And then below that, we have goods that are outside ourselves. And so since happiness is the highest sort of good that we can have in this life for Aristotle, it's going to have to be a good that is a good in the soul. And so happiness is in the soul. Then point says, as I said earlier, that happiness um, isn't identical with the harmony of virtue, but we need a sort of harmony of virtue to um, be able to be um, virtuous, that it provides the necessary dispositions, as also he points that having some sort of um, pleasurable goods, some sort of external goods, right? So these bodily goods, we need bodily goods. We need to be healthy in order to be able to study. We need to be able to have eaten enough. We need to be able to sleep well in order to study. Otherwise, we're not going to be focused. Uh, we also need external goods, right? So we need the food to be able to eat. We need uh, a bed where we can sleep well and a roof that we can have to protect ourselves. And this is very similar to um, a quote we have actually in the book of Proverbs, where um, King Solomon and those after him are trying to seek after and live the good life and are doing another sort of philosophy similar to Aristotle, but was included within the Holy Scriptures. And so in Proverbs uh, chapter 30, verse 8, we have, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. So we want to desire neither poverty nor riches. So some people take up beyond what is required of nature and pursue a life of supernatural poverty in accord with the teachings of Christ. But that is not required of all of us. For most of us, we don't want complete poverty. We want, we're not trying to seek beyond what is a built, a, a good for our nature. We're simply trying to seek with what is proper in accord with it. And so we simply seek to, um, we don't want too little, but we don't, can't provide for ourselves, but neither do we want riches. If we have too much money, then we start thinking that money is good for its own sake. And so we want a happy medium between the two. Go. Um, he also points out that um, some people are naturally, by simply the luck of birth, given a better position where they might have um, being born in a good place or being born to a family that has a lot or um, being born beautiful. They could have different things that are make it easier or harder to have it. And so for Aristotle, part of what you need to be happy for him is luck. Uh, but we can also consider now having a broader view as Aristotle doesn't have a conception of divine providence. And that's a big thing St. Augustine will take up is a notion of divine providence. And so we can know through faith that God has given everyone in accord with what they need. And so some people might be in a luckier place. They might have been given what they need, but there's some sort of good that God is seeking and gets certain people not having things. But Aristotle can't possibly know that in accord with what he can know by reason. And so he says, it seems to him from his perspective, some people are born luckier and have a better position. And he says that's, he, he thinks luck is needed for happiness, but again, it's not identical to happiness. All right, so if happiness, it isn't, it's some sort of well-being in the soul. Uh, we need rationality, we need external goods, we need virtue and so on, but how do we actually get to be happy? And he asks, well, how, how do we get it? And he first says, um, we can get it either by learning or by divine providence or by chance, right? So he says, it could be given by the gods. And for Aristotle, he has a pagan conception that there's all these different gods uh, it seems from 
uh, when he treats the Greek religion now and again, it seems he is very skeptical of a lot of the aspects of Greek paganism, that it seems very superstitious, not really in accord with reason. But he also thinks there's a very important aspect to religion, right? And we shouldn't just denigrate him for not having what he couldn't have possibly known. He did the best of what he could know, and it was very good that he was pursuing the goods of religion. But now we have the true religion, which has been revealed by God. And so we are able to know much better what actually is done by God because he has revealed it to us through the divine will. And he says, well, God could get, simply give us happiness because happiness is, is God-like. It's the closest humans on earth, he thinks, can be like God. Uh, we could simply get lucky, but most of us can't get that, can't be lucky and simply get it by being given by the gods. And so the way most of us are going to get virtue is through training, that we are going to practice virtue day in and day out and slowly work at developing virtue. And this is where right, we ultimately can't get that just from this class. This class can give us the general outlines of how it is to be virtuous, but ultimately you have to desire and seek every day to act virtuously, to grow in virtue. And that's an important part of uh, the spiritual life, but also just beyond the spiritual life, living as a human, seeking to do best as what is in accord with your human nature. Um, he points out, all right, who can do this, though, right? And he says, some people are more or less lucky. And he says, but for all who are not maimed in regards to their potentiality for virtue may win it by a certain study and care. So while some people might have better luck that they started off with, he thinks anyone who isn't maimed, anyone who isn't, for him, essentially mentally incapable, or they actually have an actual mental handicap that is stopping them from doing it, anyone who isn't that way um, can be happy. And that's ultimately, as we see, given that um, we now have, knowing that everyone has made the image of God, we can know that everyone can pursue this being happy, even if it's different ways for different people, even if it takes a certain study and care that we have to develop there. And he also asks, um, is there any con other conditions that exist for it? And he says that there's sort of this interesting mutual relationship between individual ethics and politics. Because even though our ethics is for the sake of the political common good for Aristotle, we also need, we also are by nature citizens. And so we are going to need um, some sort of, um, was it, um, we were going to need the city as the necessary preconditions in order to be able to um, uh, be virtuous in the first place and then be happy, right? Because the city is going to help us develop in virtue. And he's going to deal with this quite a bit uh, when we look next week at books eight and nine of um, the Nicomachean Ethics. Right. And he finally says, right, that um, right, we don't call animals happy because they're not capable of sharing in such an action. They're not rational, and so they can't have this higher happiness. And he says, even children in some sense, we call them happy by hopes that someday they can better develop these virtues. But while they are still just children, Aristotle thinks they can't really fully share in this happiness. All right, now in 10 and 11, he deals with this difficult issue of can a man be happy in this life? Uh, this is difficult chapters, and they're not directly, they don't directly pertain to the ends we're discussing here. So I'm just going to look over them generally. And um, if we were more giving a more detailed account of ethics, we would go much more in detail for them. But essentially what he says is that in some sense, we can be called happy in this life, because and this is when we are being well. But not absolutely so, because in some sense, while we're living in this life, we could then fall away from happiness later on. And then we wouldn't really have been a retrospect considered after our death to have been a happy person. And so we want a complete life of happiness. We want that to continue all the way to our end. right? And taking this up now, 
and what we know from theology, right? We ultimately know that our happiness continues after this life in the beatific vision. And so ultimately the whole purpose of our life is to form ourselves for that final moment where we're going to face and either go to heaven or go to hell. And so we're ultimately trying to form ourselves in virtue so that we can have that eternal happiness. And so Aristotle ultimately doesn't really have an idea of an afterlife because he, he has a general sense that the soul is probably immortal, but he doesn't really know what happens to it because it hasn't been revealed. That's not something that could be known by reason, even if uh, the immortality of the soul might be able to be known by reason. Um, and whether or not the immortality of the soul could be known by reason is somewhat of a disputed issue. We could That could be taken up um, in a course on psychology, but we're not going to deal with that right here. All right. Um, now going on here to chapter 12, he asks um, whether happiness is an act or a potentiality. Is it simply something that we could have, like a certain disposition for being happy, or is happiness something we actually have to live out? And he says, now happiness is something actual. It's something that we have to actually live out and um, be always continuing. And he notes that this happiness, this living is what is to be praised, that we're showing our happiness. We're actually living it. That's what's to be praised. And he points out that the gods are always being happy. They're always living well. And that's why humans call them blessed and happy because they are always living uh, well. And he points out this is another evidence then against uh, pleasure being the um, highest good. Because pleasure is not generally something to be praised. Right? People don't say, oh, that was really good that you are living a life of pleasure. No, people say, praise people for living a life well. And so clearly that's another evidence against pleasure being the highest good. All right, looking then at um, chapter 13 now, he looks at um, a more detailed um, account of happiness now. When he says, in order, if we want to really understand how we're going to be happy, we have to understand virtue. And so that's ultimately going to be the account he's going to take up in the rest of the notebook in ethics is how do we live virtuously? Because virtue is ultimately the highest, the most important thing that we're going to need. And he also points out here then that the student of politics must study the soul, right? Because the soul is going to be the subject of the virtues. What are we trying to make virtuous? The soul is what we're trying to make it virtuous. So he's going to give a very brief overview then of the different parts of the soul. And this is really something that we would um, take up a class on psychology where we're studying the mind. But for here, we're just going to have a very general overview, which Aristotle gives here. And he divides really three parts of the soul. There is the vegetative part of the soul. That's what we share in common with animals. So these would be the powers of nutrition and growth and also of reproduction. That uh, plants, they can grow, they can take in nutrition, and they can create offspring. And this is something that we share in common with the plants. There's also some things that we share in common with the animals. Um, that there are the senses that we have, uh, that we share in common certain appetites for things, certain desires for things, certain fears of things. And so those clearly... Um, are not fully speaking properly the subject of um, virtue because animals don't develop virtue. And we share these things in common with the animals. But he says they're somewhat in common in, uh, relating to virtue. Because some of the virtues are going to focus on regulating the appetites. Right? Certain, um, so when we have um, what's called the concupiscible appetite, the desire for things. We could desire too much of things and be and so we need to regulate that with the virtue of temperance. We also have the other appetite, which is the irascible appetite, the fear of things. And so that's regulated by the virtue of fortitude, where we stand up against fear. And so this relates to it. But ultimately, the um, source, uh, the most important thing to discuss here is the rational soul. Because the rational soul 
is going to, and this is what humans have uniquely, is going to be able to have intellect, to be able to think. And so is going to be able to order the passions properly and be able to order the virtues properly. And now Aristotle is a general idea of there's something like the will, some desire towards the good, but he doesn't have a fully developed notion of free will that we will have. For Aristotle, the will is simply some sort of disposition towards uh, the good. And so Aristotle then distinguishes two kinds of virtues here. He has intellectual virtues. This is primarily prudence, which is going to be regulating the intellect to be able to know what to do in every general situation. I mean, go the very bottom here, we have the intellectual, and others are mo are uh, moral wisdoms or moral um virtues rather that these are going to be the ones that are related to the will and the appetites and so on. These are going to be things like fortitude, temperance, and justice, and so on. And so this is going to be the ultimate um, breakdown, then, of the virtues. All right, so now we're going to turn to Book 5 of the Nicomachean Ethics and take up the... Um, virtue of justice now because there's lots of different virtues that aristotle discusses but it's really the virtue of justice that will pertain most directly to what we are going to be um dealing with here which is politics and so we're going to now turn to book five of the ethics all right now we're going to be taking a look at um book five of the nicomachean ethics and here Aristotle de uh, delves into the virtue of justice. He's going to try and understand what it means for something to be just. And um, as you saw when you were reading it, issues of politics come up quite a bit here as well. So earlier in Book 2 of the Nicomachean Ethics, which we haven't read for this class, Aristotle establishes... Um, what a virtue consists of and essentially he finds that there's three parts of what a virtue is which he's going to bring up here again when he looks at justice uh, he wants to consider uh, what kind of actions uh the virtue is concerned with um and what sort of mean it is in between extremes so for aristotle all virtue is a mean in between two extremes and so he wants to determine here what the extremes are. And as we're going to see, this um, works very well for the other virtues of the categorization system. But for justice, he ends up focusing more on the actual acts of justice rather than the extremes. Oh, that would be a defect of it. So now he goes on to see what it means for justice. And right, he says, we see that all... Uh, men mean by justice that kind of state of character which makes people disposed to do what is just and make them act justly and wish for what is just. So when he's talking here about justice, he's not talking about particular acts of justice, but rather a certain virtuous disposition. That's another important point of what it means for something to be a virtue for Aristotle. A virtue is not an individual act that is good or bad. Um... A virtue is a certain disposition of the person to generally and freely, without any compulsion on them, do what is right. And so when we talk about justice here, we're talking about a certain disposition that makes people act justly. Uh, and likewise, injustice is a certain vice that disposes people to act unjustly. And the way we acquire those virtues or vices is by repeated practice of the actual acts. So we become a just person by doing just acts over and over, and we become an unjust person by doing unjust acts over and over. Um, but as you practice one or the other, it will become easier to act rightly or to act wrongly. Right. And now he wants to ask, well, what does it mean when we talk about um, something being just or unjust? Right. And so we want to distinguish just and unjust. These seem to be ambiguous for him. And so he wants to figure out what they are. And so he um, distinguishes there's two sense in which something can be just. 
Uh, he says, the just then is the lawful and the fair. And you also see it other translations where it said a fair as equal. So there's a sense in which justice is acting according to the law, in which it is acting simply rightly uh, in a more general sense. And now he talks about the unjust man as uh, grasping or covetous, right? That he um, is going to be constantly desiring other things because he doesn't have a proper disposition in himself to be acting justly. Um, yeah, in this sense, for he doesn't, he's not well disposed, essentially. Now, in this last paragraph here of chapter one, he considers justice, right, as it is lawful. As he says, since the lawless man seems to be unjust and the law-abiding man just, evidently all lawful acts are in a sense just acts. For the acts laid down by the legislative art are lawful, and each of these, we say, is just. So a law is determines what is just here, right? That uh, we ought to follow the laws set up. And the purpose of the legislative or the purpose of a legislature is to create laws that will cause people to act justly. And he says, now the laws and their enactments on all subject aim to the common advantage or the common good, either of all or of the best or of those who hold power or something of the sort. So in one sense, we can say that those acts tend to produce and preserve happiness and its components for a political society. So the purpose of law is to create a society in which people are going to be living well, in which they are going to be happy. Um, right, and so that's what makes it a good law, is a good law is going to cause people to act justly. And this is, again, going back to the purpose of politics for Aristotle, is people creating a situation in which people are acting virtuously and living well. It's not simply for the protection of individual rights for Aristotle, because he thinks when people just act however they want to, people tend to act actually in an unjust way. They tend to act like the animals and just follow their passions. And so we want laws that are going to encourage people to act well, according to Aristotle. Because, and the law bids us uh, do both the acts of a brave man and those of a temperate man and those of a good tempered man. And so he goes on of all the different acts of virtue that laws command. Laws encourage, uh, good laws really encourage virtue for Aristotle. Because this form of justice then is complete virtue, but not absolutely, but in relation to our neighbor. So this is really then the core of the virtue of justice, right? Law can command different good acts and encourage us to develop these different virtues. But fundamentally, when we get down to justice, it's being able to have all these different virtues, but not for our own sake to benefit us, but in relation to our neighbor, because the law ultimately can't get inside of us, right? The legislature, when it legislates, can only legislate our acts as they are public and so affecting others and can't ultimately get into our hearts and force us internally to be virtuous people. And so justice is ultimately then going to relate to our relation with our neighbor. And therefore, justice is often thought to be the greatest of virtues, neither evening nor morning star is so wonderful. And proverbially, in justice, every virtue is comprehended. Right? We see people having to practice every virtue when they practice justice, because they have to practice it, all the other virtues in relationship to their neighbor. It's also then the greatest of the virtues for Aristotle, because right, remember, the highest good for Aristotle is the political community. And so since justice is the virtue which relates to the political community, it's the most important and the greatest of all the virtues. And it is a uh, complete virtue in its fullest sense, but is the actual exercise of complete virtue. So we actually show and exercise the virtue, which for Aristotle is greater than simply having the disposition. Right? He said earlier in book one that it's not really a virtue if it's only in disposition and not in acts as well. <clears throat> 
In, uh, justice alone of the virtues is thought to be another's good because it relates to a neighbor and does what is advantage advantageous to another, either ruler or co-partner. Uh, now the worst man is he who exercises wickedness both towards himself and towards his neighbor. And the best man is uh, not he who exercises virtue towards himself, but he who exercises it towards another. For this is a difficult task. But it's a lot easier to be virtuous simply for your own sake. It's much more difficult to be virtuous to benefit another. And I think as we see Aristotle's comments on the virtue of justice, this is, I think, in many sense, Aristotle getting closest to uh, a Christian sense of virtue. But here he's dealing strictly with right and wrong and doing well towards one's neighbor. It doesn't get up to the sense of the supernatural virtue of charity, that you do well for the other person simply for their own sake and for God's sake and not for any sense for your own sake. Uh, and the, in the virtue of justice, it still is ultimately be, simply according to the rules of justice. It can't go any higher than that. I think we'll deal with that more when we get to the virtue of charity in uh, St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. Uh, he opens up here in chapter two, just saying that the virtue, what we want to investigate is just justice as it is a part of virtue. It's not a universal understanding of what is just. Um, this is a book on ethics. And so it's justice as it is a disposition. In the next paragraph here, he um, is drawing a distinction between uh, fair and lawful. Right. And so he um, says here, evidently, there is a part of injustice in the wide sense and another sense particular injustice, which shares the name and nature of the first as its definition falls within the same genus for the significant consists both in relation to one's neighbor. But one is concerned with honor or money or safety, which is all of these. And if we had a single name. And is the motive of pleasure which arises from gain, while the others are concerned with all the objects of which the good man is concerned. So here he's saying there's just as there's two forms of justice, we can have sort of a more general sense of the rules of justice, and then we can have particular actions that fall under that. And so for Aristotle, the lawful is this larger sense. I think he actually says this in this paragraph. Here we go. This is actually what I was looking for here. Um, um, there is another sense of injustice, which is a part of injustice in the wide sense, and use the word unjust, which enters in no part um, of what is unjust in the wide sense of contrary to the law. So unlawful is the larger sense, going contrary to this larger rule of law. And then we have particular actions, which is what is concerned with fair or unfair. And so there's therefore more than one kind of justice that we have to break up here and consider. And so we divide it now into the um, lawful and the fair. And now the reason he gives for saying that lawful is the general sense and fair is the particular sense. I mean, here when he points out, for practically the majority of the acts commanded by the by law are those which are um, prescribed from the point of view of virtue taken as a whole. And law bids us to practice every virtue and forbids any vice. And things that tend to produce virtue as a whole are those acts which are prescribed by the law and have... um which have been prescribed with a view to the education for the common good. So law doesn't tell you, right, there's going to be no law that's going to regulate um, every individual action you're going to take. When you go to the store and buy something, the specific price you're buying it, it hasn't been set by law. But the general rules of commerce that if something's listed a certain price and you buy it, you only have to pay that amount. That would be then regulated here by the law, because the law is going to give those general principles that are going to regulate how people act. Uh, and you notice here, he says that the purpose of law, 
is a view towards the education for the common good. So the purpose of passing laws is not so that we always have to follow these external laws, but so that we can internalize them and have within ourselves a view of the common good and a sense of virtue, so that ultimately we don't need law, because the law has now been written on our hearts, as uh, we see uh, it described in scripture, for example. And he says, with regards to the education of individuals as such, which makes him without qualification a good man, we must determine whether this is the function of political art or of another. And so he says, Another point we're going to take up whether or not it's related to politics to educate the individual man as such. And really, it's um, partly the case that that is, because he does deal with education in the politics. Um, and then he distinguishes two kinds of justice. Once we break it down from um, the sense now of justice as fair. There's two kinds here. A, one kind which is manifested in distributions of honors um, or money or other things that fall to be divided among those who have a share um, in the Constitution. For it is possible for one man to have a share either unequal or equal to that of another. And B, one which pays a rectifying part in transactions between man and man. All right, so what are these? These are here what Aristotle what's are later called for Aristotle, um, distributive justice. This was A on our chart. And commutative justice. Hmm. And this was B on uh, Aristotle's text. So distributive justice is justice as regards the proper overall distribution and commutative justice is individual transactions. And so now he's going to go into here um, what each of these are. So now he's going to, in paragraph three, deal with distributive justice. And he essentially asks the question here, if uh, justice is concerned with what is fair or equal, then does that mean everyone should have the exact same amount? Is that what makes it equal? And Aristotle's answer is no, that there is some sense in which there should be inequality, uh, but that inequality, or not inequality, but unsameness. And so he says um, that there is actually some violation of justice when either equals have or awarded unequal shares or unequals equal shares. Further, it is plain from the fact that awards should be according to merit. For all men agree that what is just in distribution must be according to merit in some sense. So there has to be a merit according to which things are distributed. Um, right, so if someone is... Uh, contributing more to society or they have a higher role in society. Aristotle thinks that they deserve more because they play a more important role within the hierarchy of goods. Um, but it, he then goes on to describe um, geometric proportion. He gives an, an example with geometry because mathematics for the ancient Greeks is really just geometry. That was the most developed branch of mathematics they had. And this is a geometrical proportion. So if you remember back to studying math, a geometrical proportion is based on multiplication and division. And so it really deals with ratios. And this is what he's giving with the example here with um, the A is to B, so if C is to D, right? So you can have this here in distributive justice. It's A is to B as C is to D. So what does that mean? Um, right, if we have the ratio of one to two, that would correspond to the same ratio of two to four. And so it's equal amounts. So if one person is contributing twice as much to the society, Aristotle thinks that that person deserves twice as much as a fair payment for what they are doing. So to give an example 
that we might have now, uh, not to walk too much into contemporary politics, right? Let's consider someone like Jeff Bezos, who's created the company of Amazon, right? Aristotle might say that he has contributed a very important service by creating Amazon, of allowing people to get goods shipped to their house very quickly. And so he might deserve more than the average person. But perhaps he might also say that this amount has to be in accord with pr proper proportion. So it's not as though he should have an infinite amount, however much he could have. There needs to be a certain amount more, um, which is in a proper proportion to how much good he is contributing to the society. So he might say that maybe Jeff Bezos has too much for the good he has given, but he at the same time shouldn't be in the same place as everyone else. And so it's ultimately unjust then when we violate this proportion. Also should note that as he said back in book one, that we cannot have mathematical proofs in um, ethics because it's not the same subject as mathematics. You have to have proofs that are in accord with it. And so he's giving here only a mathematical analogy. There's not a certain exact amount someone deserves more than another person. Rather, it should be in accord with a um, a general sense, right? So it's not like there's the exact dollar amount that person deserves compared to another one, but a general sense that what you can sense, all right, that's getting too high or that's getting too low. Um, and also notice it's in accord with um, merit. So he says, right, there's different disagreements on what sort of merit this is. So Democrats, people who support democracy, think everyone who's a free man is in an equal class and so should have that. Supporters of oligarchy with wealth or noble birth. And so we have a society that tends to connect it with um, wealth heavily. And so you think wealth is the um, greatest good, or people might have that it's a noble birth. So this was heavily in the Middle Ages. It was where you were born in society. Um, supporters of aristocracy, which Aristotle's we're going to get into in future weeks with the... Um, is it in the politics where he's dealing with different regimes? For him, democracy and oligarchy are corrupted regimes, and aristocracy really gets too closest to what is the best regime. And he says, supporters of aristocracy with excellence. And excellence here is being virtue. So for Aristotle, ultimately, it's those who are the most virtuous in the society who should be rewarded the most. It shouldn't be based on how much money you make or where you're born in society or so on. It should be how virtuous are you, and society should reward people according to how virtuous they are. All right, so this is one um, sense of justice. Now he goes on to considering in the next chapter, uh, commutative justice. And so commutative justice here, and he gives another geometric analogy here, has to deal with uh, what's called arithmetic means. And so this is essentially addition and subtraction. Right, so we want to give that same mathematical analogy. If A is equal to B, um, then uh, what is the exact example gives? Um, here we go. Yeah, if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A should be equal to C. Right? That we want to keep a strict sense of equality here. And the primary way in which this arises in society is this is transactional. So we should have, um, if you're thinking, for example, in the case of a marketplace, right, when you buy something, let's say that costs five dollars, it doesn't matter if you're a person who is very high up in distributive justice or very low in distributive justice. Everyone has to pay that same amount of five dollars, that it's an equal exchange in an arithmetic sense. Um... He also gives another example with a judge, and this is going to give us a very interesting look into how this plays into politics as well. And he says, this is why when people dispute, they take refuge in a judge and go to the judge um, is to go to justice. For the nature of the judge is to be a sort of animate justice, for they seek an intermediate. And in some states, they call uh, judges mediators on the assumption that they will give uh, what is intermediate, then they will give what is just. And the just then is an intermediate, and so is the judge cell. So the judge restores equality. 
So the point of a judge is when there is some violation here in uh, commutative justice, the judge can restore what is proper to them. And so, right, if someone steals something that, um, or does something that might cause someone, let's say, $100 of damages, that person is now obligated to pay that $100 of damages. And that would be the proper commutative justice, because it's an equal amount, or equal in an arithmetic sense. And so both loss and gain um, are going to deal with an arithmetic mean. And he notes above here that, and back in chapter two, that it could be voluntary or involuntary. So voluntary, such as transactions, purchase, loans, uh, so on and so forth. So all sorts of things that we agree to to exchange. And others are involuntary, theft, adultery, poisoning, procuring, enticement of slaves, assassination, false witness, and so on. These are all involuntary. And some are involuntary and violent. Uh, such as assault, imprisonment, murder, robbery with violence, mutilation, abuse, insult, and so on. So we could either have just simply monetary um, senses of involuntary violations of commutative justice, or we could have um, ones that are violent. Or you notice here, this is under commutative justice. So if someone, let's say, commits murder, Right, they should be punished not in accord with their status in society, their status according to distributive justice, but strictly according to commutative justice, regardless of where their place is in society. All right, going on then to uh, chapter five here, he deals with uh, the purpose of money. And so um, he discusses money as a means of exchange to ensure um, proper commutative justice. He gives the example of a builder and a shoemaker in a house and a shoe. I mean, a one house is not equal to one shoe. So how do we determine uh, what is a fair payment between a house and a shoe? Well, we use this intermediate stuff called money. And so that way we can evaluate how much the house is worth according to an amount of money. And we can evaluate the shoe according to what is the amount of money it costs. And then we can have an equal exchange between the two. And so money exists as a means of exchange that ensures the possibility of uh, commutative justice. All right, and now he finally says, all right, now we've established just and unjust. What is the mean between the two? It seems that for his other virtues, mean between extremes is very important. So for example, with the virtue of uh, courage is a mean between the virtues of being uh, reckless and being fearful. I mean, so if you're courageous, you don't want to be fearful and run away from what is scary, but you also don't want to be reckless and go into a challenge that you won't actually be able to face. If you're in battle, it would not actually be courageous to charge into battle if you can't win the fight. Um, it would just simply be reckless. And so now what is the mean here for justice? And he says it's a mean between being treated, uh, acting unjustly and being treated unjustly. And so there's one extreme where you act unjustly and you um, harm someone else because you act unjustly. And there's also, though, for Aristotle, it is unjust to be treated unjustly. So if someone else acts unjustly towards you and they're taking advantage of you, letting them take advantage of you for Aristotle is not virtuous. Um because you're not actually following the virtue of justice there. You're, you're going to the other extreme. And we should note here that, right, for Aristotle, it's strictly according to this fairness of either in a geometric sense in distributive justice or in an arithmetic sense in commutative justice. There is no um, middle ground, or there's no sense of charity, of going beyond the um, strict confines of justice. Right versus 
um christ tells us for example in the gospels right if they slap you on one cheek present to them the other in aristotle that would not have been the case it would have been if someone slaps one cheek you slap their cheek back that would be according with what is just um all right now going on here to um chapter six he returns to this again this idea that justice is not simply unjust acts but a certain disposition in the person so if you steal once you're not a thief um it's if you steal repeatedly then you become a thief because you've developed the habit of it um Here we go. And then he's discussing, all right, so if we're going to have this, he says, now we have previously stated how the reciprocal is related to the just, but we must not forget we are looking for not only um, what is just without qualification, but also political justice. So he doesn't want to just say justice in a um, um, universal. <laughs> Sorry there. I want to consider not just justice in a universal sense, but ultimately the Nicomachean ethics is building up to the politics. And so he wants to consider what is political justice here. And so um, here we go. In order to have political justice, he says there must be some sort of law that governs it. He says justice exists only between men whose mutual relations are governed by law. For law exists between whom there is um, injustice. For legal justice is the discrimination of the just in the unjust. So when we're considering justice in a political sense, the law is what governs it. So right, going back again, the law is the universal sense of justice, and the just and the unjust are particular instances of um, right and wrong. And this also is um, gets taken up then in the Roman legal tradition and taken up then in the Middle Ages. And we're going to look at this more closely when we study St. Thomas Aquinas, that it becomes very, very important for the foundation of modern political theory, where this distinction becomes confused in Thomas Hobbes. As we have law, and in Latin, this is lex. And then we also have what is fair or right. And this in Latin is use. And use here comes from the Latin justitia which is justice. And so use, a particular instance of rightness or fairness, is a particular instantiation of this larger principle of justice. And this is where we even get the concept developed. We're going to, in this course, study the development of the theory of rights as we now have them and as are enshrined for the U.S. in the Constitution. And it ultimately is going to develop out of this distinction between the law and what is right. Um, for Aristotle, right here is not the same sense as right as we now have it in um, political philosophy, or as we have it rather in our constitution. For Aristotle, right is the object of justice. You'd have objective right. This is the uh, particular instance of justice. And this is justice for Aristotle. Or this is right, rather, for Aristotle. As distinct from subjective right, which is a um, certain freedom from the law. And this is right in the, Amer in the later sense, um, will be developed since. Right? American Constitution. And if you don't understand this distinction yet, that's perfectly fine. This is a very, very difficult distinction to grasp, and we're going to be studying it all year. But for right now, uh, we want to focus on looking at what's right in what Aristotle means by right, which is a particular instance of justice, or as our text translates it as fair. Um. Here we go. All right. Um, 
Yeah, and so law is going to then shape what is justice. You know what is just and unjust by going to the law. And so um, this is the purpose of law then. And this is why we do not allow a man to rule, but as a rash, but rational principle, because a man behaves in his own interests and becomes a tyrant. The magistrate, on the other hand, is a guardian of justice, and if of justice, then of equality too. Right? So the government, whoever is running it, the magistrate, they should set up laws so that we are ruled by law. And this is a very important principle, uh, both in Aristotle and the American Constitution, which is the principle of rule of law. So rule of law is the idea that we are governed by law, not by people, right? So the point of the judge is to return to the law and look at what the law says and not to govern according to their own opinions. Because if they simply govern according to their own opinions, then they're going to start ruling in their own interest and it's going to cease to actually be just. All right, then, going on here to um, chapter 7 here, he makes a distinction now um, between, actually, I should go on, I want to touch on one more thing here on um, in chapter 6, which is different types of justice. And he says, the justice of the master and that of a father are not the same as the justice of citizens. And master here is referring to a master of slaves, and we're going to, talk about um, slavery and Aristotle later on when we discuss the politics. And I know it's a very difficult issue. So we'll, we'll get to that when we get to that. But right now he's saying that essentially the way someone rules over their family or rules over uh, their slaves, this is going back to our distinction of different types of political philosophy. This would go under domestic or societal or what for them is called economics, household management. Uh, versus what we're concerned here when we're talking about rule by the law is political justice. And looking at it insofar as it is part of political philosophy. All right. So now he says a political ju justice part is natural, part legal. It is natural that which everywhere has the same force and does not exist by people's thinking this or that. Uh, legal justice, that which is originally indifferent, but when it's, uh, it has been laid down is not indifferent. So, um, yeah, when we have a um, certain things that are in accord with nature, Aristotle here is starting to develop a sense of what is called natural law. And when we talk about nature here, right, we use this word nature a lot. Uh, what we tend to mean by nature is what occurs a lot in nature. But this is not how the ancients or medievals meant nature. Nature is um, what is in accord with human nature. And so the natural law then is going to be laws in accord with human nature. And so for Aristotle, he has a sense of natural law that's closer to what is later going to be called when um read the medievals, the use gentium or the law of the nations. And this is what we see everywhere. Here we go. So these are just simply principles that we see in every society. And so we can know that's the case. So for example, that it's wrong to murder someone, right? You can go to any society and see that it's always wrong in every society to murder people. There's never been societies that say it's okay. Right? Even in modern American society, where we've now made it legal to murder children, right? We the uh, Defenders of that will usually not say that it's legal to murder children. They'll try and justify why the unborn child is not a genuine child, right? Uh, they almost never try to argue that it's actually, they are a child, but it's still perfectly okay to murder them. And so this is what is meant here by natural law. And once we get to St. Thomas Aquinas, we'll see it gets developed in a more metaphysical sense of nature. But for right now, for Aristotle, he's describing it, it's a more general sense of what we see everywhere in every nation. Um, and then we also have things that are laid down by convention and are not in, 
um, everywhere the same, but are not indifferent. So, right, um, it says that a prisoner's ransom shall be a mino, right? So that it costs, uh, we can just switch to dollars to uh, switch from uh, their currency to our currency. We might say that um, the ransom for a prisoner should be $1,000 rather than $2,000. Right? There is nothing that is a universal principle in nature that is that case. Um, we sit down particular acts. It's, or that a goat and not two sheep shall be sacrificed. Right. So for Aristotle, actually religion is part of the uh, virtue of justice. And we'll go into that more when we study uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. But he says the universal principle that you have to offer sacrifices to the gods. But there is no particular law in nature that tells you whether it's a goat or two sheep that you have to sacrifice to the gods. That's going to be set up by particular conventions. And so acts then become unjust when they violate the law, either the natural law or this um, written law. Right. And so going back then to chapter six, when we see his distinction that justice requires or some sort of law to govern relations, this isn't only the laws that are passed by your particular polity, but also these more basic natural laws that are known everywhere. All right, now going on to, um, here we go, chapters eight and nine here. There you go. He deals with issues that are not as directly related to political philosophy. So we'll sort of breeze through these chapters more quickly. Um, he essentially asks the question is, can it, um, you act involuntarily unjustly? And he says, no, in order for it to really be an unjust act, you have to voluntarily do it. You have to choose to do it. Um, and voluntary for Aristotle simply means from one's own powers. He doesn't have the same sense we might develop later on in Christianity of free will. Um, and then in number nine, he asked the question, is it possible to um, treat oneself unjustly? Can you act unjustly yourself? And he says, strictly speaking, you can't treat yourself unjustly because everyone desires what is good, but you can voluntarily suffer what is unjust. So you can't, essentially, you can't be treated, treat yourself unjustly with the intention to treat yourself unjustly, but you could incidentally do it uh, by not doing what is just. I know this is, these two paragraphs are very, very difficult stuff, and they really relate more to individual ethics than they do uh, political justice. So if you're having trouble with them, feel free to skip over these and return to them another time. Here we go. And then chapter 10, he goes into an issue that um, is um, um, very, very relevant to what we're discussing, which is the issue of equity and the equitable and their relationships to justice and just. And this is these are some uh, very difficult paragraphs as well. Let me go over and define what these things are. So what is equity? So equity for Aristotle is that it goes beyond the written law. There we go. All right, so we have this natural law here. But we also then have this written law, right? And these govern here, right? Going back to our distinction of law versus fair and right, it governs this law, this general universal principle. This is general, right? And this is particular. And so equity is going to go beyond it and deal with particular circumstances. Um, and as he points out, the law is universal, where right? he says 
when the law speaks universally, then the case arises, which is not covered by a universal statement, then it is right where the legislature fails us and has erred by oversimplicity to correct omission uh, to say what the legislature himself would have been done if he were present and would have put it into the law if he had known. So let's say someone does something that is obviously wrong and would have been legislated against if the legislator had known, but he had not actually written it down. All right. What should the judge do then? And Aristotle says the judge has to apply equity and go beyond the particular law. This deals with particulars and do what the legislator would have done. So even if there isn't any particular written law dealing with it, they can apply the more general principles of justice that have been guided by law. Right. So justice has been shaped by law. And so we can apply justice through equity, even if this particular circumstance hasn't been covered by the law. And here uh, we can maybe look at how judging for Aristotle falls as a mean between two extremes. All right. Uh, judging as mean between extremes. All right. So we can have um they can err by defect or what aristotle calls oversimplicity right by not applying equity and they could apply excess where they go too far where they rule not according to law or rule really contrary to law here to law or contrary to justice where now they start acting according to their own opinions and not really the principles of law here All right. Now, going back then to, um, you're going now on to chapter 11. He deals with in the first few paragraphs here, again, can a man freed himself unjustly, returning to that question. And we've already dealt with that here. Um, one thing, interesting point he does make here that is relevant, though, to political philosophy Um where he discusses here, for example, the instance of suicide. And for Aristotle, the fundamental crime here is he still acted unjustly. He says, he who through anger voluntarily stabs himself does this contrary to the rule of life, and the law does not allow. Therefore, he is acting unjustly. But towards whom? Because you can't act unjustly for Aristotle towards yourself. And so he says, surely towards the state, not towards himself. Because the good of the polis, of the political community, is higher for Aristotle than the good of the individual. And so by harming yourself, you're actually harming the political community, which you are a part of. All right. And finally, dealing this last point here, he says, metaphorically, in a certain... In the virtue of a certain resemblance, there is a justice, not indeed between a man and himself, but between parts of himself. So we can't have... Um, we go back to the different forms of justice, right? We have political justice, we've dealt with mostly here, which relates to political ethics. We have domestic and societal sense of justice, but what about an individual sense? And he says we can have this metaphorical sense that justice is a certain harmony between the parts of the soul. So just as there is a distributive justice, all right, between the ruler who's the highest, and we have the people below him, we have different levels of the people and so on. We have within a um, family a different sort of thing where we have the um, parents and the children below them. And for Aristotle, there's also the slaves that are below that. And so on, there's a certain hierarchy within the family. Um, for Aristotle, there's also this harmony within the soul that we want a proper balance of the virtues, and then we want the rational part of the soul to stand over the irrational parts. We want our intellect and our will to govern the lower faculties of the soul, the uh, appetites. And so a prop, an imbalance between the different parts of the soul, not according to distributive justice, would actually be a violation of justice in this metaphorical sense. Right. And we can go back and see that um, all the way back to the very beginning of book one, right, where we discussed the idea of the good is which that which all things aim at. And we discussed here how in the metaphysics, right, he says that there's this sort of universal good, which the whole universe is aiming at, which is God. 
And so for Aristotle, there's a sort of beautiful harmony in the universe, everything being ordered towards God, the individual citizens in a political community being ordered towards the good of their political community and the family, everyone being ordered towards the good of the family and within the soul, the proper ordering of the soul. And so the whole universe is this sort of great hierarchy for Aristotle um, in accord with distributive justice, right? And we look at distributive justice as well, right? It's this proper ratio. And for the ancients, they actually discussed ratios a lot when it came to the mathematics of music. And so they saw this sort of great cosmic music going on of this proper ordering of the whole universe in different parts. I know that's a very difficult concept to wrap our minds around nowadays, but um, that's not something you need to grasp right now. But I would start meditating on it and try and understand how distributive justice is really this much greater cosmic principle for Aristotle. All right, so now that we've gone through all the readings, hopefully you should return to the readings now. I'm sure there was many spots in the reading that you found difficult on your first read and use this as a chance to better understand the readings. And if there's something still after that you don't understand, uh, feel free to reach out and post in the Google Classroom or comment under the video. Um, asking questions to clarify more, and um, we can continue to discuss these things. And also, as we continue to read and study Aristotle, and especially uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, who is the greatest commentator on Aristotle, uh, certain things in Aristotle that might be difficult now will be more clear later on. And we are going to constantly be returning to these concepts all throughout the year. So it's okay if you don't understand something right now. That's why this is a whole class and not just a... Um, a whole year-long class and not just one class in one session that we're going to end here. All right, so um, I'll see you next week then as we continue to go through the readings then.